Welcome, it's uh, 3 p.m. and now on stage is Angel Ramboy um, telling us about RESTful APIs in the gaming industry. Hello everyone, can you hear me? So, is that statement accurate? Not really. And I'm going to uh, expand on that in just a moment. My name is Anjan Boy, and I work for the most awesome company in the world, Demoware, of course. Demoware is based in Ireland, and uh, when I moved there, I had to adapt fast in order to survive in those foreign lands. This is my solution. <laughs> Demoware is an Activision Blizzard subsidiary. We have offices in Dublin, Vancouver, and Shanghai. We're around 200 people, but we like to keep the startup-ish feel to the company. Um, what do we do? Well, basically it can be summed up as straight from one recruiting book. We enable gamers to find one another and then shoot each other in the face. And we're pretty good at it. What we actually do is provide back-end services for Activision Game Studios, um, for leaderboards, matchmaking, anti-cheat, uh, accounts management, and more. We have like 70 plus services that serve our past games and also upcoming games like Call of Duty Advanced Warfare and Destiny. Oh, it's crap there. And of course, we're hiring, so if you're interested in what I'm about to show you, please come talk to me afterwards. So back to our previous slide. Is this statement accurate? Well, as you can see from more of our graphs, uh, the, count, the user count doesn't come even close to zero. And with, with over 100 billion uh, API calls per month, well, that's an API's dreamland. And these guys get really excited during launch time. I mean, I heard HR offices around the world experience a spike in sick days requests in November. I want to tell you that this is just a coincidence. It's not us. Um, talk overview. I'm going to touch on um, uh, topics ranging from API uh, design to authentication and authorization. So uh, let's get to it. Why REST? First, interoperability. Our APIs must be uh, available to game clients, websites, companion apps, and uh, by using the right protocol, HTTP in our case, and the REST principles, we can achieve that level of interoperability we need. Second of all, scalability. From all the architectures I've came across, uh, REST looks like the only one that's truly web scale. Basically, you can look at the web as a huge REST API, and your browser is the client that consumes it. So you have your entry point, your bookmark, you use HTTP verbs to uh, talk to web pages, you have links from one page from one page to another, from one resource to another. Uh, you have URIs that define resources, and also your browser interprets those resources based on hypertext and metadata. So I think it's safe to say that using a RESTful architecture style to your uh, API design, for your API design, uh, will make your services easier to scale on the long run. Anyone who ever worked on API probably heard of Rye Fielding's thesis. Uh, it's an interesting read, and when you're um, done with it, you're left astonished by the elegant concepts outlined in it. You want to adhere to, a, to the, those concepts, and you will probably succeed. But then you realize that whatever you'll do, your clients will misuse your otherwise perfect creation. In the gaming industry, things get more complicated. You have custom protocols because everyone has to do their stuff. Uh, you have mandatory libraries and SDKs. You have multiple uh, languages and platforms, C Sharp, .NET, Java, you name it. And documentation goes from OK to non-existent. Most game developers have uh, little to no contact to, with web services uh, over the most uh, time of their careers. And some user education sometimes is needed, like even for simple things like what a JSON is or what HTTP codes mean, or how to use uh, query strings. Um, only in recent years, the gaming industry started to embrace HTTP and REST-like services that uh, make life easier for us. 
Uh, having said that, are our APIs RESTful? I want to say yes, but even I have to admit that we don't adhere to all the principles, uh, either because of business constraints, legacy logic, or backwards compatibility. The important thing that is that we're moving in that direction and we are encouraging our clients to follow suit one step at a time. So design-wise, we, we would get post put uh, delete verbs for API CRUD, we use HTTP for the communication protocol and JSON for representation. And every time we do an API design or work on a design, we try to be pragmatic about it. Like good enough is better than perfect. Other things we use design-wise, uh, we have version in the URL, but it's mostly semantic. Uh, we tend not to break backwards compatibility. It's mostly to tell the client that we have this set of features that it's only available in version two, for example. So uh, we also have a camel case in JSON and query strings, not in Python code, or we have a mapping to underscore for that. We use standardized dates, uh, also links to other resources, and of course, it's humor readable. Just using REST is not enough to run your services at scale. Uh, you need to have the right processing tools in place. So I'm gonna walk uh, you through how we do it at DemoWare. We use Chrome and Kanban, uh, depending on what works for the team uh, or the release cycle. We also have automatic builds that test uh, everything that's merged into master and uh, tests against also our other systems. So, so everything is all right, everything to be all right. Um, Demo services use a lot of different texts, so I'm gonna focus only what, what we use for our APIs. So we Python 7 and Django 1.6. We also use MySQL. Uh, at DjangoCon this year, uh, some people were really surprised that we still use MySQL in production and that it scales really well for us. So at one point there was even a show of hands and about 90, 95% of the people were using PostgreSQL. So I'm curious here at EuroPython, how many people here use MySQL? Can you raise your hands, please? Uh, PostgreSQL in production? Hmm. About the same. Uh, MongoDB? Okay. So our reasoning is that we couldn't find enough pros for other SQL databases that would warrant a, such a big migration for our infrastructure. And MySQL is, is doing some really good developments in the last few years, so it works pretty well for us. As you, ah, sorry. We also use CentOS 6 and Apache and mod Whiskey. Uh, as you can see, uh, we don't use anything flashy. Our layout is simple, reliable, and easily scalable. Our projects are built with uh, sharding in mind, also our dev environments and our builds uh, run uh, the unit tests, acceptance tests, and all other tests against sharding environment, sharded environments. Uh, our tech stacks, uh, our layout also saves us from uh, a lot of tech stack related issues most of the times, and um, lets us focus on real business problems. Reliability is something we take really seriously, as you can see compared with other big game launches in the past few years. Uh, for code, we use Git and GitHub Enterprise. Uh, we use feature branches. Master is always deployable. Uh, we do pull requests for team review. Uh, and when all the builds, uh, all the uh, features are in and the builds pass, we uh, bag it, tag it, and ship it. We use RPMs for our um, uh, packaging. Uh, we individually package all our dependencies and uh, match our own repo for dependencies. I'm gonna talk about a bit about uh, schema migrations. So schema migrations are not straightforward when you're uh, working with huge amounts of data. So there comes a time when you uh, need to do a schema change but you cannot afford any downtime. And when you have lots and lots of records, an alter can mean um, table lock. And when you do a table lock, you're gonna have a bad time. 
For this, we use uh, Percona Toolkit, which is a clever set of scripts uh, created by Percona to deal with these kinds of situations. We also use Percona MySQL fork in our production environment, but the tool should work for pretty much uh, any MySQL variant. So what does the tool does behind the scenes? It creates an already altered table, a copy of the uh, original table, then sets up triggers for insert, update, delete uh, on the old table towards the new table. So everything is in sync. You have, uh, for every operation, you have consistent data. Then copies the data over in batches, while in the meantime monitors the slave lag and adjusts the batch size or just stop, stops the operation to uh, let the slave uh, get in sync with master. And at the end, just renames the table, which is an operation that takes fractions of a second. Uh, the only downside of this process is that it uses, uses a lot of uh, space as it duplicates all the data in the tables. But other than that, I, we couldn't find anything in our Lotus that could uh, deter us from using this tool. This is how um, our configuration uh, file looks like. So why YAML? First of all, cross-project. We're not a pattern-only shop, and we need to be consistent uh, with configuration files across the board. Also, YAML is just as diffable, as readable as Python code, and it has to be um, reviewed by people who don't know Python. Uh, also validation, we dynamically build the, the Django settings module at runtime from the loaded YAML file. So we check for missing configs and invalid values at this point. This way, if something is not right, we know before the actual setting is used. Not when, uh, we know when it's loaded, not when it's used in the app. Uh, this is a simple uh, example of uh, the validation, what our validation library does. It just for type a valid entry. It has default and description, just to give you an idea. On the subject of validation, to validate data sent by our clients, we use JSON schema, and it's pretty awesome. If you haven't used it, I really recommend it. Um, as you can see from this example, you can do all kind of uh, fun stuff with it. You can have uh, restriction by type, uh, minimum, maximum to integers, uh, pattern matching. You can also have max, minimum length for strings, required fields. Um, you can also have uh, different errors depending on what kind of, uh, of uh, exception is encountered. Uh, and the cool part about this is that in your Python code, you can see all the primary validation related to an endpoint or to a resource in one place. You don't have to jump hoops or uh, really dig around. <laughs> Just uh, one thing to mention, we don't use this for heavy business logic validation. Uh, it can get messy and it's harder to maintain in the long run. For error handling, it's where Django middleware shines. So in our views, in your views, you just uh, raise the exception in the middleware, we'll catch it in its process exception method. And then you can wrap it in a nice HTTP response and send it back to the client like this. So you might have to do some adjustment depending on what your client needs or what you need, but that is basically it's pretty, we don't do anything fancy there. Um, you can also see we use a hierarchical approach to our um, errors and also to our error codes. So that's where most of the design work goes into on how to trace back from those errors to the actual thing that happened. Um, for logging, syslog relays our logs to an aggregator built on open source tools. In the end, you get something like you see here. Uh, we use Logstash, Elasticsearch, and Kibana for uh, front end. Um, these things are somewhat noisy in this slide, but once in a while you can see exactly that something's happened and you need to act. Uh, of course, we don't spend all day looking at these graphs. We have alerts that do that for, you, for us. But uh, looking at them, we can have an overview of the frequency of the errors and also the time frame when that happened. For example, deployment, an event, you have a promotion for a game or something like that. Uh, we tend to keep the needs of production as opposed to development when we 
uh, format our, lo uh, our logs. Uh, the logs need to be concise, complete, and contain context. Think about it this way. If you put a log in a bug report, would you understand immediately at first glance uh, where the issue occurred and why? So we try to guide us by those principles. A brief example of uh, logging. As you can see, we have the level of the error, the project, the app. So you can search pretty much easily uh, based on um, keywords from all the logs that we get from all our uh, services. Besides our logging, we use metrics, lots of metrics. Um, all our metrics sent to an aggregator that verifies and sorts them and then sends them to Graphite. And you finally get uh, the visual image you see here. So what's the difference between logging and metrics? With, with metrics, you get different information than with logging. You can have like uh, how many mails sent or failed, SQL query times, slave lag uh, over time, uh, app response times, uh, user creation of time, user deletion over time. And you notice uh, anomalies like that right away in the middle. Um, again, Django middleware to the rescue. For example, for this simple example, we have a, um, we uh, record in the request the start time of the request, and then in the response, we do a diff and we send the request time to our metrics aggregator. It's pretty straightforward. There's nothing, uh, no rocket science there. We can also add here, for example, you the process exception method, and you have metrics for your exceptions, and you can log, uh, see uh, metrics of different types of exception over time. Odd. Sorry. For authentication authorization, we use JSON Web Tokens. JSON Web Tokens contain claims that a system can use to access resources it owns. We use two types of JSON Web Tokens. We have JSON Web Signature Objects, which are claims that are Base64 encoded, but carry with them a signature for authentication. And we also use JSON Web Encryption Objects, which are claims that are totally encrypted with a public-private pair. Um, for that, we use a JSON, uh, uh, a framework created by us in open source. You can find it on uh, GitHub and also pip install it, try it on. It's called Jose. Um, I'm going to walk you through what, how it can be used. Uh, as you can see, you have your claims there. You have your issuer, the expire time, and the subject. And you also have uh, the password. So you just sign. This is for uh, JSON uh, web signature. You sign the, the claims. Uh, you can use either a synchronous or a synchronous uh, algorithm for signing your views. In this case, it's a synchronous. Um, this is the object you get. You get header, payload, and signature. Then you serialize and compact it and send it to the client. And the client just like one line of code verifies it and knows it. it's OK. For uh, JSON web encryption objects, uh, it's pretty much the same with the difference that we use a uh, key, uh, pub, private public key pair. And we encrypt it with a public key. You get a slightly bigger object. You see as it at the client side, you decrypt it and with the private key, and there you have it. So, in summary, REST is awesome. Use as many concepts as you can but be pragmatic in your approach. Uh, error logging and metrics uh, monitoring are what makes scalable survivable. And scaling survivable. <laughs> and uh, we're hiring, of course. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a good five minutes for Q&A. There's one microphone, and I'm on this side, so. Hi. Uh, thank you for your talk. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, the last two bits, which is JSON Web Signatures and JSON Web Encryption? 
um, in a sense of like how what, do you guys what are you, uh, how do you guys use it? What is the um, what's the research that you did behind it? Uh, do you do you believe this is uh, secure? Can, is it like what are the constraints? We, we did quite uh, some research and we think it's pretty secure for our use case. So for our use cases, uh, I guess is secure enough. <laughs> um, we're gonna release a new version of Jose uh, like in the next in the near future. I should have more uh, context and uh, better security. Probably this uh, will be, uh, this um, example will be a bit updated, outdated, but from our research, as we plan to have some uh, some APIs more open in the future, it looks like it's pretty secure. If I, if it's, uh, it, it, I don't know. I, I don't know. We can we can talk about this. We can expand on this subject afterwards. But it's, security is not an easy subject to approach. This is how we do it. Uh, we can talk a lot about this if you want. But one quick remark: Am I right? JSON web signatures and encryption are open standards, right? You did not invent those. Those are open standards, or uh, yes, yeah, standards. Yeah, yeah, open standards. So, so what, what we did not invent. No, no, no. Okay, yeah. okay. So these are based on open, or on standards. You wrote so, the library for that. Yeah. So uh, sorry. Yeah. Those are. Uh, so we did not invent JSON uh, web tokens. Hi, thank you for your talk. And uh, well, we, brief we briefly discussed this earlier. I just was wondering if uh, there is a specific reason why you decided to implement your own framework rather than using uh, another framework, other such as a uh, Django REST framework or another one like for the yeah. API. You mean? Yeah. yeah well, exactly. we use Django, which is a framework in itself. I think uh, <laughs> it's safe to say that. Um, at the time when we started developing our own framework, there, we didn't have uh, a lot of choices, viable choices. Now you have Django REST framework and uh, TastyPy, uh, which are pretty mature. Uh, back then, I think there was only Piston, which is not even maintained anymore. Uh, and it didn't suit our needs at that time. So that made us made us do our own thing. Okay, more questions? Hi. Uh, do you use anything for measuring response time or throughput of a new version of your software? Uh, you mean like load testing? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, we do load testing a lot, but it's different. We don't do... Uh, I saw some companies, for example, when they update a new version, they uh, put part of their cluster or a node of their cluster in production and see how it behaves directly in production. But we tend not to do that. We load test before with, uh, with real machines, just with the production-like environment and production-like requests. Okay, so a, a proper staging environment that you test load? Things. Yeah, but it's, it's an exact replica of, this, of the production environment usually. Okay, then that's it. Thank you very much again. Thanks.